So good morning, uh, ladies and gentlemen. So thank you uh, very much for joining us this morning. So I'll just share my screen for everyone. So welcome to the uh, fourth edition of the next TV uh, series, Europe's and CEE 2020. So as you already know, we were forced to postpone our physical event, which usually take place in Berlin. However, to keep the next TV series communities connected, so we have decided to organize this two and a half virtual event with interesting panel discussion for the whole industry. So we would like to thank all our sponsors for their support, as well as all the speakers for their participation. So I'll now just give you a broad overview of today's agenda. So for day one today, we have the panel, which will be starting in less than five minutes, the pay TV CEO strategic insight. Then we'll have the TV broadcasters advanced advertising strategy. Moving on, we'll be having the innovation in content distribution. And then from pay TV to cloud TV, we'll then have a one-to-one -one session uh, with, uh, on, the, on the topic, what can TV learn from the cloud? Moving to the next session, we'll, we'll uh, have a focus on CEE, pay TV operators, strategic insight. And then the last panel for today will be pure players in uh, in Europe. So I remind all our attendees that you can send us your question on the chat box throughout the panel. I now have the pleasure to welcome for the first panel PayTV CEO Strategic Insight. So Mr. Stanislav Yogev, CEO of Bill.com, Mr. Rose Louis Vasquez, CEO and founder of Mirada. Thomas Burova, CEO of Seagate, Victoria Bukla, CEO of United Group, and Bjorn Jaivan Moen, CEO of Alente. So this session will be moderated by Anna Schaffer, Independent Consultant and Managing Director of Big Picture. So as I did mention, so feel free to send us your question in the chat box and we'll, uh, we'll make sure that we have them answered uh, after the panel or during the panel. So, Anna, you have the floor. Okay. Priscilla, thank you very much for the introduction. A very warm welcome also for me, and I'm um, excited to moderate this um, panel and um, get all the insights about the page PCO strategies that you have probably adjusted in the recent months according to the COVID crisis. And I think it, it will be very interesting to kick that off and to understand what kind of measures you have taken in your business regarding a crisis and what kind of changes in consumer behavior you have uh, recognized throughout the last couple of months. Um, so um, who wants to go first and would like to talk about it or give us some insights that would be interesting for the audience, uh, what we have done. Victoria, ladies first. <laughs> Uh, so we should uh, start with COVID, or how we have done, uh, adjusted to this to COVID. You mean? No, yeah, how you what you have recognized in the business, what you have changed in consumer behavior, or what yeah. you are thinking about in the future. Well, first how of all, I, oh, sorry, go ahead. What your content maybe looks like, or how you what you changes you have taken besides maybe from operational. Yeah. Well, first of all, from the from the operational point of view of course it was the key for us to uh, organize in a way that we protect our people of course it was a huge shock so uh, the first measures that we took we definitely you know had to had to protect them so organizing remote work organizing all the uh, you know different uh, protective measures um, we were very happy, and I guess uh, from the training session, we heard that, uh, that my colleagues had the same experience to actually organize remote work of call centers in one or two days. 
yeah. or, or even offices, you know. So this is something which we've been talking about, you know, and so on, but to support our customers and at the same time to protect employees, uh, we had to do it extremely efficiently. Uh, second of all, uh, our focus was, of course, uh, customers. So customers, we immediately opened full programming schemes across all markets so that uh, customers could uh, have, uh, uh, you know, more kind of entertainment at home. In some of the markets where we had capacity, we also increased data allowances uh, for free, of course. We had to focus a lot of efforts on uh, increasing capacities on fixed networks as well because the traffic, again, I don't know what was experienced from other markets, the traffic in our case went up 50%, around 30%, uh, we also saw increase in TV consumption. And uh, uh, another thing that we also saw, which we kind of also suffered, we, we provide a lot of sports, we do a lot of sports, so we saw a huge decrease in all sports kind of uh, competitions, or let's say they stopped. So. We saw people, you know, kind of suffering and uh, going for the library content, uh, watching some, we tried to provide them with the, uh, you know, some uh, games, uh, historic games, you know, some library games. So that was something that uh, that, that also happened. Uh, but uh, all in all, I think it was a great test for us as operators mm -hmm. to see how quickly we can organize and adjust to a uh, completely different situation both in terms how in terms how the touch points function, in terms of how the networks are being used, in terms of uh, uh, how the customers are behaving, this increased you know kind of consumption of everything, uh, and um, I think that uh, I, I'm, I'm from our side uh, we are extremely happy how we managed to do to deal in this difficult situation and to actually provide people with such essential services at the moment of lockdown as uh, actually home entertainment and great connectivity. Yeah, thank you very much. I think these adjustments, uh, can somebody else to take that as a, as a elaborate on it, what kind of adjustments you had to take? I mean, it was very comprehensive what uh, Victoria just told us, not only about the content, but it's also about the capacity of the network, the services, the operations. Um, can come, come, perhaps come with a slightly different perspective because um, um, and that was an impressive story by, by, by you, Victoria. But um, um, I guess we're all baffled by how many things we can still do as companies during a, such a pandemic. We, in, in our case, we actually did um, a merger between two companies across four countries. And that, uh, that was in the brink of happening just when the pandemic struck, right? So we had our closing day on May 4th. And of course, people weren't able to meet. And that is having all kinds of strange sort of effects. I have an HR director who's never met anybody outside of her home country, which is Norway in her case. But it still works, right? We're still able to take care of our employees. We're still able to take care of our customers. We're still able to, to handle operations. So it's certainly an indication of what really is possible. And maybe it is a trend shift uh, also that will also be lost over time in terms of how we work. Mm -hmm. It's quite impressive what you just told us that you even were able to complete the merger between the satellite and, and the fixed line operator in, in various markets. I mean, it's very ambitious, but also very impressive. Jose, have you any experienced any change in the demand from your customers uh, over, over the last couple of months or how you have adjusted as a, as a provider in this? To this um, we actually have seen uh, quite a a movement in the in the market consumption um, in terms of linear, obviously, because of the increase of access or increase of interest on the on the news channels, they all rocket up. But if you go to linear, it was just an increase of 25% of consumption. That's a lot. When you go to video on demand, the average between our customers was between 45 and 50% increase on video on demand consumption. And yes, this was uh, during the confinement during the first two months but it has stayed uh, at a very, very high level after that. So it means that uh, a big percentage of the subscribers actually joined the video on demand that uh, were not interested before. Uh, this happened also to uh, subscription video on demand to SDOD services as we, have, as we have seen in the market. And you're operating not only in Spain or in, in Europe, but you have, you have operations around the globe. Do you have seen different, different uh, behavior or is it very uh, I say not linear, but it's very homogeneous. Uh, well, <laughs> the, 
this is one of the few occasions in which we are actually sharing the same uh, fears and the same behaviors. Uh, it was all across the globe, very little differences between the countries. And obviously, uh, what you can uh, uh, notice is that in terms of consumption, some countries are more interested in some specific pieces of content uh, than others. But in terms of the increase, it was pretty much uh, the same between 40 and 50 percent in, in broadband and in video on demand. Okay. Um, Tomas, you had also told us before we, we, we spoke um, preparing this, this, this panel that you also said that you would probably have made measures if you would not go back to the to the, to the previous operation. Uh, so good morning, everybody. And um, yeah, that's absolutely right. I think that uh, one bold statement that I would like to say is that most probably we will never go back to the same uh, lifestyle, same way we are working, the same way we are operating as we did before. It just the the change which happened uh, changed so many habits. It changed the way how uh, people consume content. It changed the way people are working. Changed the way uh, we entertain ourselves. So, so I think that uh, um, most of those things will stay in the long run because this is what we observe. Uh, for example, that uh, the consumption increase that you're all saying, it's absolutely uh, comparable with Lithuanian uh, reality. We have a growth of around 30 to 50 percent on, on Internet traffic, on, uh, on pay TV. So, so that's, that's uh, more or less the same thing. Uh, another thing is what we did uh, when um, all the quarantine started, the first wave, we, uh, we just immediately changed the way we work and um, uh, we launched the hybrid uh, hybrid C project as we call uh, which actually enabled in one day everybody to work from home and um, later on after the quarantine we started to think what's going to happen now if everybody will start to go back to the office or not and we made one change when we let all the employees to make a decision based on themselves, so they can choose how they want to work. We can continue working from home, we can continue working hybrid, we can come a couple of days to the office and a couple of days from home, or just choose to work all the time from office. It just uh, absolutely freedom. And what we noticed that in all those quarantine period around two and a half months, people used to work from home. And for our big surprise, uh, only around 5% came back to the office. So we, we never forced them to go back to the office. So we, we made on their own decision to come back. And during, uh, during this period, we see that uh, people change habits, people change the way how we work. And uh, also from the clients, uh, when quarantine started, we immediately started to see big demand of higher tier internet plans. And uh, we are pay TV and broadband operator uh, market standard is 100 megabit speed on the market, and which is absolutely good speed for for many things, right? It just, but um, due to the fact that people change the way they work and they live, it turned out that when you are sitting all family at home and doing uh, school at home, doing uh, all work from home, so entertaining yourself from home. So uh, the need of, uh, of bigger, uh, higher tier internet speed just started to be as a new trend. And the interesting thing is also what we, what we saw that this is not going back. So people, we launched campaigns that we gave people uh, free of charge trial period so they can try high internet speed and just to make a call if they want that afterwards to, to keep or not. And we see that people want to keep it. They don't want to go back. And, uh, and that showed that, OK, we're not going to be the same as we used to be. So I, I think that um, we are now faster. We are more flexible as companies, as people, as employees, as family members. We, we started to live different life. And we started to find different ways how to entertain ourselves, even how to um do some housekeeping yeah we 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 are not going to the restaurants but we found out that it's quite okay to order food or or, or to cook more or whatever 
and uh, all these things, I, I really enjoy that, um, that to see the transformation. So not all the things are so bad about the COVID. So we, we learn to be different, different kind of people. Yeah. Stan, what was your experience oh. in Bulgaria? Oh, well, my story is quite, I mean, I, I, I really would like to uh, jump on what uh, uh, Thomas just said. I mean, it's, um, I have a little bit of a different story because the lockdown actually got me to a different country. My home is in Vienna mm -hmm. and I had just uh, taken a new role as a CEO in Bulgaria and then the lockdown started. So this morning, it was one of the few mornings that I spent with the family and I was asking, so what is the safe corridor in the house that I can walk in underwear? Because everyone was in front of a TV and I'm, I'm, I'm still learning how to tackle these things. Um, so I, I practically agree with everything that was said so far. I mean, we also opened the whole portfolio to the subscribers as Victoria just mentioned. Uh, they did. We also have increased traffic. Um, sports was definitely an issue. Um, on sports, uh, for example, what we did was that we used the same time slots uh, for the different um, types of uh, uh, games. And we started, for example, broadcasting uh, archive content with Pete Sampras and Agassi during the tennis slots, et cetera, et cetera. So it was a good opportunity. I mean, From where I stand, the whole crisis was practically an opportunity. I, I don't think our industry in particular suffered. I think this was a very reviving event and it, this was an event that gave us uh, the opportunity to do a little bit of uh, deep dive and, and analysis and insights into what we are, uh, what our responsibilities are as, a, as an entertainment industry and At least from our perspective, I don't think any of the companies operating in the region really did suffer. I mean, mm -hmm. everything you just shared, said was good news. I mean, increased traffic, increased demand, uh, more time in front of the TV sets. Of course, operationally, we struggled because uh, we have to take care of our employees. We have to take care of ourselves and our families. But if I have to, I mean, it's been like six months already. Yeah. So I think it's like... Um, time long enough for us to be able to come to some like conclusions and and like learnings and after mm -hmm. all now it's about to repeat itself anyway so it's good to have some learnings um i would i would put them into three particular slots i mean one is that i think we finally i mean we, we came back to the core i mean our role is to be the link uh, to to the households for Uh, towards information so it is really our responsibility as pay tv operators as as entertaining as media companies to provide media to provide access to information and to entertain our employees uh, our our clients i mean sometimes we are focused on growth on gross additions retention etc but i think this was a fantastic learning where we belong and what our responsibility is so those who know how to do it, those who really focus and haven't lost the touch with reality, uh, that this is who we are, that this, we are entertainment companies. I think those are the companies that really um, successfully passed uh, through this uh, period. The second very important learning from my side, at least, is the digitalization. I mean, this is all across industries. Uh, those who had advanced in digitalization were just like that. Uh, easy to adapt into the new lifestyle of working remotely. I mean, I, 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 for example, came into a company that didn't have a shared calendar. So the first thing I did was rolling out the G suit because without, without having a, like a proper communication exchange within the company, it was absolutely impossible to do any work remotely. So, so this is how important digitalization is for any kind of business. And it's a process that all of us have to always push forward in, in order to, um, to, to, to advance uh, our companies. Uh, with regards to digitalization, I mean, some of us operate in more Southeastern European countries. So uh, Victoria, you know it pretty well. I mean, people actually go to the shops to pay. So mm -hmm. it was very important uh, to bring in the digital payments to come up with, uh, with strategies, how to push people to pay digitally, to start trusting the banks finally mm -hmm. after all these years. So uh, that was definitely something that uh, we had to do as well. And the third learning is delivery. 
we did focus on delivery. We did not focus on growth, on cost savings, optimiza optimizations. It was really the time when we as companies focused on proper delivery. We checked the quality of the service. We made sure that the broadband networks can sustain the traffic because if, if they don't, I mean, we wouldn't be able to even have this session right now. So yeah, that's, that's pretty much the conclusions I, I came to. Yeah, I think it's very, I think insightful for the audience, um, especially what you said about, I mean, you all said about capacity increase um, that will stay. You have to more digital, you have to adjust your operation, but also it's, it's changing consumer behavior, right? And the question is what will stay? And I think it would be very interesting to see how you, or what you think about how you would adjust your strategy in the future regarding content, you know, what, what do you think will stay? What will um, come with more capacity? The consumers have more also chances to subscribe OTT services. A um, lot of multinational, international companies making inroads in various markets, even if they not really focusing on smaller markets, but nevertheless, this is a big brands that coming to also to your markets. So now the consumers are being prepared to have enough well, decent bandwidth in the household, they have the devices. The question is, what does that mean for your content strategy and for your content in the future and how you will yeah, maybe adjust it or you will not only adjust the content itself, but also how you bundle it and how you bring it to market. Um, I think some of you already said about as VOD or our on-demand content is, is increasing. Um, would you, who would like to talk about this? Because I think that's very interesting because these markets are very different. And um, I think when you look at, at uh, Bjorn's market in Norway and the Nordics, it's, it's different, different consumer behavior than maybe in Serbia or Croatia or in Bulgaria or in, in other markets. So what's, what's your ideas and thoughts about? I can yeah. start. Yeah, yeah, so um, basically, uh, United Group's strategy has always been investment into media. So we don't only aggregate, we don't only rebroadcast uh, the, the content which somebody else produces, but uh, it's really part of our DNA to produce content itself. And uh, of course, we also aggregate, meaning that we, we, we buy movies as well. Of course, we buy sports. Uh, we produce the, the most popular sports uh, uh, channels in the region. Uh, but uh, our recent uh, uh, shift, even before this current situation, has been into local production. So production of news, production of uh, series, production of entertainment shows. Uh, we also own the biggest music production. And uh, we will, we definitely see the highest ratings, the most popular shows are the one which, are, at least in our region, in our markets, are the ones which are produced uh, locally. Of course, uh, uh, if you look at the viewership charts, you will also see uh, that, uh, of course, Hollywood movies, the series are scoring very high. And I'm pretty sure there is a certain degree of subscribers that have additional SVOD subscription on top. Mm -hmm. So Netflix, uh, Disney, we don't provide it as part of our package, but I'm pretty sure that you see that as well. HBO is also very popular, but as I say, for us, local content is uh, really, we can, we can really see that it, it's paying off in terms of the investment. Of course, it's more expensive, but it's paying off. And uh, uh, we took this decision even before COVID, but uh, again, we continue to, to deepen this uh, further. And moreover, in our strategy, we see that you can monetize content in various ways. So, okay, we are monetizing through pay TV. We are more and more monetizing it through different digital forms. We are monetizing content through YouTube. Uh, we run the biggest also distribution, digital distribution house uh, for music, but also for other content. So you can see other ways. Uh, so our strategy so far, and will continue to be a lot of investment in local content. We don't run away from any other content, of course. So whatever we think is relevant, whatever we can bring on the table to our subscribers, we'll bring it. If Netflix or Disney uh, will want to form a partnership mm -hmm. and... Uh, Part of our, uh, on our uh, and be part of our offer to our subscribers will go for that as well. 
but uh, really uh, for us the key strategy is investment in local. So the importance of local content in, it's not so much about aggregating international or multinational content. I think that's a very valid point here. Um, who else has say a different view or has had also a particular content strategy for their markets or have seen it as you, um, Jose, when you with your customers that they have adjusted something particular to the audiences or to, to their markets? Um, well, what we have seen is, is actually a couple of factors that uh, made uh, our customers um, start uh, a transition in, in the way they, they operate. So there are two, two big factors. One is an increase on broadband capacity. Uh, as, um, it has been said um, in, in most of uh, the countries, actually people were trying to reinforce their connectivity uh, capabilities because because they, they realized how important having a good broadband connection at home was. Okay, so this allowed our customers to have a more powerful services. Um, there was a shift to VOD between audience on, on linear channels to VOD. So if there was a trend uh, or a transition from the linear channels to on-demand channels, uh, it was only accelerated by the COVID and it came faster than they expected. Okay, so they needed to um, speed up their strategies in terms of super aggregation. I know that this is uh, now the, 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 the fancy word, super aggregation, but this, this was something that our customers started before the pandemic and they needed to push. Uh, if you look at Disney, how uh, they have been able to manage to, to grow in the middle of this, this mess, okay? More than 70 million subscribers now. Um, our customers were really hungry to, to get as many um, agreements as possible with this uh, super aggregator, uh, with this uh, OTT services. But this is because at the end of the day, um, you need to uh, be able to give your uh, subscribers what they need. And what they need is content. Uh, Victoria said uh, that the, the local content was really important. This is absolutely true everywhere. If you are just an aggregator of content of third parties, anyone can do that. Anyone can get agreements or most people can get agreements with the big mayors and, and, and have a bundle. But if you uh, really uh, identify what your audience is looking for, local content in general is something that scores very high. Okay, So the super aggregation strategy cannot be only based on agreements. It can be uh, based on production and it can be based on uh, looking for uh, local strategies. And one element I would like to mention, and probably we will have time to talk about that today, as the SIF uh, uh, in viewers is coming from uh, the linear to the on-demand, also the advertising budget is moving. Mm -hmm. okay? So you cannot uh, develop a strategy of aggregation of content without taking into consideration what is going to happen with this advertising budget that is leaving the linear channels. Mm -hmm. I think super aggregation has its um, upsides and downsides. And I think the upside is the convenience for the customer to pay one bill to have one service provider to talk to if something's not working, but usually in the on-demand world, everything works quite okay. Um, for various markets appropriate, but I think that the, the balance, and I think that we see that shift, what Victoria just described to this local content and things that really are being closer to your, yeah, to your home or closer to your market where you live or to your environment where you live. What's the experience from the other providers? I mean, the Norwegian Scandinavian markets are quite different from Central and Eastern Europe. And, and uh, Bjorn, have you adjusted your content strategy throughout the crisis? Or are you, you also operating satellite business or IP driven business? So you have different audiences and different subscribers. Yes, um, good question, of course. And this is these are fundamental questions, right? Yeah. Uh, we come from a linear TV world where our, most of our customers are still on linear channels, right? Providing with uh, through uh, an ETH, a satellite. But yeah. we are also bundling. Bund bundling can happen in different ways because we have a growing area where a big, uh, an increasing share of our customers also gets broadband from us. And we do a bundle between broadband and TV. And of course, that's a very strong bundle and very strong, very present bundle here in the Scandinavian region. But then we also see the, the, the to take that kind of take our customers through that journey, right? 
a linear channels is still around. There's still a lot of things that is consumed on linear channels, the sports, for instance. But then we can take our customer through that journey, moving to the SVOC services, making that entrance easier, making it a little bit easier when it comes to login, making it an easier price model, aggregating content and in, in, into a better package and better total experience for the customer, and then potentially add value. So that's sort of our approach and our thinking around that. And then I very much agree that we can, our role is, of course, around the stronger along the local content. We can aggregate local content and provide value both to the customers looking for that local content, get it finding easy, easy ways to find it, and also then adding value to the local broadcasters looking for ways to get that content out to the customers at scale. This is a scale game, right? So we can still develop that role and have different ways of making that bundle work across technologies in terms of TV and broadband, and also then across linear channels and new type of channels and consuming that content. I think that's an interesting role. It's not only being a provider of good service for consumers, but also playing a role for the local content providers, right? So because also broadcasters have to go multi-screen, they have to deploy their signal over different um, yeah, networks, but also getting it to different consumers. And usually broadcasters are not uh, service providers, right? They're usually, they're broadcasters to produce content. And Very I think- Very much so. Right, very much so. And they're not being bothered in recent years or in general be, be thinking about distribution. I mean, the distribution of content, yes, maybe selling content to third parties, but it's a different thing, but a uh, different challenge. But here you take another role. And especially I think that, that local or transnational content is becoming, especially, I mean, also now because of the COVID crisis, we can more important news and, and, and things that are closer to your, to, to your home. Um, Thomas, have you um, adjusted your content strategy in, in recent months or um, have you changed something or your active, has your outlook changed on how you want to, in the future, what, what your role could be or what, what, uh, what you do to adjust your strategy? I mean, the balance between international and national. Okay, so I, I think I'm the only one representing small country and small operator. You are all big whales and, 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 and content is always available for you. It's just, you know, it's a matter of, the, of, of you want or not. In my case, I'm second biggest pay TV and broadband operator in Lithuania. And for me, life is a little bit different in terms of the content. Uh, COVID situation actually created some additional opportunities in, in the content area as well. For example, um, we are not producing content, we are only aggregating content. And um, uh, due to the fact that cinemas were closed, we got a new opportunity to be, um, uh, to be a platform uh, for the movie festivals, for example. So all of them were closed and suddenly uh, uh, we never had a chance to get uh, distribution rights, never ever. And suddenly we are having them and we are cooperating with the, with the big Scandinavian movie festivals, uh, local movie festivals. So um, it just uh, created possibility for us to try and for the content providers to try different approach. So that, that's one thing. Another thing is what, what we see that, uh, of course, the move between linear uh, channels and VOD is happening and uh, it's going back and forth. And, 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 and what we see, the, the, the more we dig, we understand that for the client becomes quite complicated to, uh, to find content. And um, uh, if, we, if we take, let's say, older technologies, not talking about uh, uh, Android TV operator tier, for example, but talking about DVB-C, let's say, right? Or let's say DVB-C with a catch-up. Um, linear channels, for example, if I'm having 80 or 100 linear channels and I have, let's say, two weeks catch-up service, for me as a client to find the content becomes quite a task because it's not so easy and, and you need to scroll around and, and you have some favorite channels and they are approximately 10 out of those 100. But in reality, when we think as operator, how many content is available for the client, it's enormous amount, right? So what we started to see that there is a very nice opportunity uh, to present that content in a different manner 
and and this is our change of a strategy when we are now developing the new platform uh, Android TV uh, operator here uh, proposition for the clients. We understood that it's not only about VOD services to to provide. Of course, we're gonna uh, gonna cooperate with with a couple of them, but at the same time, if we aggregate and we sort, imagine from eighty channels of your channel lineup. Uh, how many movies you can find in two weeks' time. It's enormous amount, right? And, and this is what client is paying for. So if you would took them into the very convenient way to see and to find, and you place them as um, events, let's say, in the, in the Netflix, right? When you, you can see dramas, thrillers, horrors, and that you take not from the VOD provider, but you just take from the linear channel sketchup service, you can create extremely huge library. Nice. And you can make life for the client extremely convenient and easy. And uh, in combination with all the VOD on the top, it can be a bit different way of working with the content, providing content, packaging content. And, and what Bjorn mentioned, of course, uh, the broadband and uh, um, and pay TV bundles are extremely strong. And, and this is what we have in Lithuania. It's like from our total client base, uh, around 80% are bundles, uh, pay TV plus uh, broadband. And and this is, this is now the, the next step, how you can actually add and uh, uh, mix VOD together with linear channel content and creating opportunity for the consumer to find easier and to consume just the content, but not to consume linear channels and VOD, because I think that in general, it's all about the content. And we are, as an industry experts, we are talking about two different content sources, but in reality for the client, I don't care. I just need my content and that's it. I don't care from, from which source it comes. So this is the mindset we are trying to change. Let's not think as a um, as a operators, let's think as a consumer, and this gives a tick actually how you need to change your content strategy. And not I think you're touching. Yeah, that's about sorry, it. I think you're touching on something very very relevant because yeah. it's it's so much good content out there, international content and local content. Exactly. And then we yeah. can then build fantastic recommendation engines, and we do right to, in yeah. order to suggest something for the customer, and that does part of the job. But not, I'm not entirely convinced that that is enough, right? Because you get some kind of uh, advice, and then you think, "Have I heard about this before?" No, better surf around a little bit more, and then you end up uh, looking around for a long time on the platforms, right, trying to find something that would suit you. So I think part of the equation when talking about cooperation with broadcasters is actually to exposing the content in other channels as well. Combination of exposure, combination of recommendations and marketing, mm. traditional marketing yeah. and exposure of the content is it needs to happen. Otherwise, we'll end up with an incredible long tail where people will watch a little on very, very many series. And that doesn't quite do the job that we're looking for, mm. does it? Yeah, yeah. Mm. yeah absolutely. Um, yeah. If I can jump in, I, I'm, sure. I'm very happy that actually it's the first time I heard some things that I basically disagree with. I mean, this is what makes an interesting panel. Uh, Jose said that everyone can do that and that you have to uh, look into like strong ways to differentiate. This is how I understood it. I kind of disagree with that. I mean, I think we really have to understand what our role is and which, what kind of business we are in. I'm, I'm more prone to agree with Victoria on the DNA thing. I mean. Our DNA is exactly to, uh, to be content aggregators and delivery companies. I mean, I at least perceive our industry as the little or the biller of the entertainment industry. I don't think everyone can become little or biller so easily. I mean, I don't know if you have these um, supermarket chains in your countries. So, um, yes, I mean, they do produce their own content like we all do. I mean, I don't know all, but we produce a few channels of our own. However, I personally believe our role and responsibility is to cater to, cater to the needs of our consumers, whatever they are. And I think the way to differentiate in our industry is just to be very good at what we are supposed to be. Not to look into our own content or some exclusivities, because look at telcos. I come from a telco practically as my former experience. And I have to say that now in a 
pure pay TV company, I completely changed my mindset. I thought that we could do great TV in telcos. Um, Annette, I guess you had the same idea as well. We were in a very similar situation with you. But actually, I came to the conclusion that this was not true. I mean, telcos do broadband. Telcos sell mobile services, mobile data. This is what they're great at. I mean, they're great digital companies. But, but I don't think telcos can do fantastic TV service. I mean, this is what a company like SBB, for example, can do because this is how they started. This is what Bulls.com has been doing for more than 18 years in my country. So practically, if, if, if you produce too much of your own content, you lose focus because this is what you want to do. You want to push your own content to your consumers. Look what mm -hmm. happened with Netflix. I mean, currently they recommend 99% their own production and it's not necessarily what is best on the markets. So um, this is exactly what I believe is a, like, a, at least for my company, the way ahead. I don't want to excel or to push on production. I don't want to buy the most expensive exclusivities in the market in sports. I don't want to uh, invest too much into own production. What I want to be is the best supermarket uh, and the, the company that caters uh, the content for our consumers, because this is what my consumers expect me to be. So when the time comes and when Netflix finally localizes content for the region, I, I will be the first company to bring them on the market because this is what I believe my role is. When Disney does that, that's again what I'm, I plan to do. Uh, so practically, let's not forget that these, um, there is also a question coming from, from Priscilla, okay. our host, about the fatigue on subscriptions. Yes, there is. In, in spring, I read a study about the US that an average household there has uh, 7.8 subscriptions on different OTT services. Well, if, if you look a picture of all the different um, uh, libraries, online libraries that exist, because I mean, these OTT services are in the end content libraries, uh, it's, 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 an endless, it's an endless list. So it, it is again our role as company that are delivery companies and that we interact with the households to aggregate, to bring the content, to recommend in a very similar way, like we used to order channels in an EPG. I mean, putting a channel in an EPG position is also a big responsibility. Where does it belong? Is it after news? Is it before news? Is it the, is it the first sports channel? So all of these things are our DNA. We know how to deliver the content and we know how to cater the content to the consumers. Like a supermarket knows how to cater ketchup or vegetables to the to, to, to the to the buyers. So this is this is my position. As long as we do properly, we have a bright future ahead of us. Thank you. Uh, may, may I, Stanislav, as you mentioned my question, um, a, a couple of things. Uh, I believe you are completely right in terms of uh, being uh, focused on uh, the delivery. Uh, you, you are really 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 on the point because at the end of the day you are the one that knows the customer better you are the company that is really providing the the, the the big set of services and you have the tools to collect the different elements to be able to understand the final customer so this puts you in a in a very very strong position i must disagree in terms of uh, media focus for obvious reasons okay but my my point is um when you talk about broadband, you talk about mobile, at the end of the day, there is a fierce competition. When you talk about media, uh, it's, it has been uh, proven that, that the stickiness of media services, especially if you are able to uh, collect information about your uh, behaviors and, and being able to build the profile of the user is, is a very, very high uh, uh, loyalty scheme, uh, retention element. So most of our customers, especially with the sports, uh, are not that sure that they actually win uh, money with the sports, okay? But at the end of the day, uh, people will not uh, cancel the subscription because they will lose this access to this specific piece of uh, content. And at the end of the day, there is a bundle. And talking about bundle, and I, and I finish with this, some people take the super aggregator, aggregator thing like uh, agreements with different uh, uh, content providers. We don't see this this way. Um, you have a very, very long tail, uh, that's true. 
the only way uh, that you can uh, make a value out of that, that it can be worth it for you, is, uh, as actually Thomas was uh, mentioning, having a really good uh, recommendation and search integrated tool. So it's all it's all based on the metadata, on metadata agreements. Just having your user experience, your own user interface, it is you, it's your application, it's your uh, Android TV operator tier or whatever uh, user experience, what is giving the access to the content. It's not anyone else's application. And you were completely right, Stanislav, if you are able to collect data about your users, if you are able to identify the, the behavior, to identify their profiles, then you will be able to build a good user experience that no one else can build apart from you. Yeah, I mean, recommendation and curation, we have to be careful when, when in which of, in the two directions we are, like, I mean, which one we're talking about. I'm personally a bigger fan of curation, to be honest, because recommendation engines, I at least I haven't across a great one so far. I mean, on in a recommendation engine, we as an operator rely too much on some software or artificial intelligence somewhere to like properly analyze the behavior of a consumer and give a proper recommendation. Whereas curation is where I believe we, we have uh, some strengths because we can <laughs> recommend as an operator or like DJs recommend music. After all, this is what we do as uh, TV aggregators. We recommend channels, we put them in position. So I'm a fan of curation myself. Yeah. If I may just add uh, to the point uh, of the supermarket. Uh, I think that, you know, even if you take the supermarket as a knowledge to what we are doing, right? So we, first of all, pay TV provider, can be a pay, provide, pay TV provider with the connectivity or without connectivity, right? So like you can own the big supermarket building or you can lease it. You can, you, if you go to the super, so what, what is then important is the platform. And that I agree completely with Tomas. We also pay extremely, uh, extremely big attention now to the uh, user interface. Uh, we introduced the profiles uh, this year, actually after COVID. We were working on them in any case, but we introduced the profiles. We have our own proprietary system developed uh, by our innovation center called Eon platform, which are rolling out, which will be rolled out also in Bulgaria. So uh, we, we are coming there as well with our platform. And uh, uh, we uh, also introduced the recommendation system. Uh, but the recommendation system is not only that you can recommend as a pay TV operator, it's an algorithm, right? You are, you, you, you are using algorithms, you are, of course, you, are, you have the metadata which you try to match to the likes of this person or, or, or whatever, uh, or a kid. Uh, so basically, I think that platform is extremely, extremely important. But then also the content that we, which we put on the platform, like in the supermarkets, you would also have the private label, right? You have, you know, private labels developed by the supermarkets themselves. Uh, so what we are trying to do is we are trying to get some of the shells, which we think are extremely relevant to our subscribers in terms of their interests. Mm -hmm. A little bit of for kids, something for, you know, for women, something for men. But basically, it's not not uh, any other strategy than the supermarkets also have just driving, trying to d drive additional value from the shelves Absolutely. and the platform that you. I completely agree with that. As long as long so as that, you don't that, become self centric and pushing your own, yeah, I completely agree with that. Yeah. And I think that, that, I think yeah, that, that, that doesn't work. If the customers don't want to watch it, they, they're just going to hate it, you know, mm -hmm. especially now the new generations, you, you just can't do this. I mean, if you're too pushy, then people will say, oh, come on. That's, yeah. that's not I, I think that you absolutely both are right. Uh, talking about this supermarket as a good example or comparison to, to what we are doing, because, uh, yeah, uh, the, the supermarket and the uh, content uh, as product on the shelf as a private label, but let's not forget what is also very important, the way how easily I can find uh, or, or how shelves are well organized. So this is, I think that the, the Stanislav what mentioned, if there is a private label, which I'm interested, but it's so difficult to find on the shelf, that's going to be a problem. And, 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 and this is what I'm talking about. This is a damn combination of of content of the platform and on the um, 
combination how we present in that platform. And let's not forget at the end of the day, how convenient is that for the consumer? And we can start to think that as industry professionals, we might think this is the best part and this is the best way of doing that. But uh, always very important that part that uh, we should look also always from the consumer and, and, and build that shopping mall or supermarket or whatever based on the consumer habits. And, and, and this is for the consumer. So I totally agree with you, Stanislav, that this is exactly our core because we know some things and we know some, our clients and we know the content. And yes, Victoria, if you have a possibility to create content, that's absolutely the key. I, I, I totally agree, local content. As I'm looking from the channel's perspective, it's around 80% of all the channels consumed in Lithuania is Lithuanian channels. So it's, it's mm. it, yeah, and again, okay, 20 of them but if you have 100, so it means that 80% of what you are paying for, you are always never watching. So it, that's the same with, with the content, I guess, in the channel inside. Local content is, yeah, is a winner. Then I guess in the supermarket thing, I think we need to make sure that we add enough value to the customer because just organizing the shelves efficiently is not going to be enough. There are other options that does that uh, very, very powerful like Apple TV where you can get everything mm -hmm. organized as well, even with, and it doesn't take a lot for them to add some kind of recommendations. So I think you need to be conscious about the customer. What's the customer looking for? What could add value? Organize it well? Yes, fine, let's do that. Make sure that it's Android platform. We have an Android platform, works very well, very proud of it. We'll continue to develop that. And then we also need to look for ways to make the bundles easier for the customer, mm -hmm. to combine two or three bundles from s into one, for instance, that is relevant for the customer, that would add value. To If you're bundling with broadband, maybe you, look in, you need to look into how that bundle could be best, uh, most powerful. Could you introduce um, security products that would add a little bit to the value? to continuously understand what the customers are looking for and then work really, really hard on value add, then I think that supermarket uh, thought can work and be powerful. Yeah. May I add uh, some uh, very, very little information? Um, we have a customer, I cannot name it, but uh, we started working with him nearly a year ago. Okay, He had a very good recommendation tool, nice user interface. Um, but uh, the consumption on video on demand was not that great, okay? So we added the human touch. We have an editorial group there working uh, and basically uh, refining the, the, the proposition for customers. So you have like a hybrid uh, automatic and, and human model. Uh, from month one, they increased the BOD consumption uh, nearly 15 to 20% just because of the human intervention, okay? And it was, fully automated before and then the editorial group. So uh, it's a, a clear example that you cannot just rely on the AI and automated tools. You need to, to add your uh, local knowledge, your experience. Uh, you are a human, you know what people are looking for and you need to have some people working there on the interface as, as Thomas uh, mentioned before. I think that's also, what we just, yeah, this analogy with the supermarket, I think you, you need to orchestrate the, the inventory, right? And you decide what or you, you try to decide what, what is on the shelf. But um, I think we have we seen changes from the content providers in the, say, um, yeah, how you can cater to your market. So saying you have more flexibility in the contract. There was also a question from the audience here. Um, do you think that there's an opportunity to get pay TV rights uh, quicker? Um, from local and US movie companies in the future, even that they also also go and direct, right? And also the intermediaries like NBC is going direct. So the question is really, I think we, we all agree access to, to, to networks, um, more different flavors of content, linear, non-linear, the mix. But I think it's it's I think your partners also, I think well, the partners in the industry, especially in the content industry also need to be more flexible um, about how they, they sell the content to you as operators or what, what's your take on that to, to be you more see how many You see how many times they delayed the um, premiere of uh, the new James Bond. <laughs> so obviously cinematic distribution for the blockbusters in particular right. is very important. 
at least from my experience, though, I can say that for non-blockbusters, it became a little bit easier because there was a lot of content imported for festivals or uh, for like local um, different ways to distribute, even for the local cinemas. And at least in our particular case, we now have access to those titles uh, in a shorter time frame uh, than, than we used to have before. So but definitely it helped. I think the biggest issue is that is piracy, actually. So we tried also, uh, because what happens is, you know, uh, when you ha it's much harder to get piracy on the internet from the theatrical release. It's very difficult, okay? They're protecting a lot, you know, it's not the same. People don't watch, you know, I don't know <laughs> if you had this or not, but I don't know, 20, 30 years ago, uh, people were actually watching like uh, movies filmed from the cinema, right? Like you would just film with some camera and people would watch it. I think people don't buy this quality anymore. So they are waiting for some first normal kind of uh, pi pirated uh, version. I call it piracy. <laughs> So I, but I think, uh, and what we tried to do one, uh, one thing with uh, extremely imp important series in our market. So we tried to do um, a binging, and we even called. I think we introduced into our on the, our markets. We introduced the word binging because even the discussion between the linguists started whether we should have used the word binging in advertising or we should have found the local uh, versions of the binging, <laughs> binging word. And we had massive anti-piracy team prepared when we launched Binging. So we said, guys, whoever wants to watch pre-premiere, so you basically you can buy for, I think we put 20 euros uh, price tag. You can watch all, the whole season of the second, uh, the whole, the, the whole se second season of this most popular ever series uh, by prepaying 20 euros. And I was, surprised how many people actually bought that but we had wow. really massive anti-piracy guys our own also third party sitting and just looking for streams and killing the streams and so on so on so i think it's a huge huge you know it's a huge effort and unless there will be some really massive solution to fight this uh, this piracy i think it will be very difficult to monetize because once it's out on the internet you can't monetize anyone mm -hmm. I had very different experience and feedbacks from, from various sources in the industry. And some of them, they totally ignore the, the piracy issue, especially when it's in some sports companies with the distribution of the region. Uh, some of them go in that back diligently, you know? So I think it's, it's, it's not funny, it's a wrong word, but it's, it's quite amazing that that hasn't been resolved, right? So this, this, uh, but I think it's, Victoria had really a point here that now customers want to have decent quality, right? So it's no longer that things have been filmed from a screen. And, um, but also there was a question here from the audience, which I found quite interesting was, is there the chance that we have, and, and um, um, Stan, Stan already touched on it, is there a chance for subscription fatigue? So people are getting tired of this, I think, um, subscribing to too many services. I think we have a different situation than in the US where people are opting their cable uh, subscription to a six, seven, as Jose pointed out, uh, individual subscription is still not paying the same amounts that they had paid before for a cable subscription. But do you think that that is for an operator a chance that aggregation model to avoid that sort of subscription fatigue? Um, because you have one service that you subscribe to where you can find anything you want, right? So um, there's probably a balance between aggregating and not aggregating, but um, I think it's, it, it's more than that. And you all set that about. Is there anything else you could think of that you would, you think that makes it, you, you helps you to differentiate besides being the orchestration the supermarket of, of, of uh, inventory? and building good access to the, to the goods that you are selling? Well, that you actually touched on, uh, sorry, just uh, just say one sentence. You, you touched on it because practically it is um, an opportunity for the aggregation. I mean, on one side, it is the so-called carrier billing. I mean, paying one bill is always preferred than paying more than one bill. And the second uh, thing is, of course, I cannot disclose uh, particular companies, but uh, let's say that the larger 
ones are actually offering a bundle discount. So this definitely is an advantage. I mean, if you, if you aggregate uh, a few of the bigger uh, media, like leading OTT uh, services, practically via this aggregation, you provide uh, better pricing to the consumers. Mm -hmm. I think in, in general, it's a very straightforward question, but there is no very straightforward answer because when you think about this one bill, I think it's a bit outdated thinking uh, as for the consumer now to have five subscriptions, you don't, you don't have any hustle paying that because your credit card is attached and, and you don't need to do anything. Just you don't need to go to the shop to pay as Stanislav mentioned. But what is the penetration of credit cards in your market? Uh, yeah, in, in our market, it's quite big. So yeah, I understand for some, for some markets, it might be an issue. Yeah, that's, that's, that's a bit different way. But still, I think that in, in general, this is going to the direction that bill is not an issue anymore, right? I think the, the, main, the main problem, for example, if we talk your markets, right? Scandinavian markets, so a credit card is not an issue, yeah? So you have your five subscriptions and you have very nice feeling that at any time you can stop what you don't want, right? With the operator, usually you have bundle subscription, two years contract and other things. So you kind of feel locked a bit. So I think that's an issue how, how to manage that because from the consumer point of view, I might feel quite okay having free subscriptions and canceling one when I don't have anything to watch on it. But when operator will provide me HBO, Netflix, Disney, and whatever else in Paramount Plus in one bundle, and at one moment of time, I will decide, oh, that's too much. And I'm not watching so much from HBO. There is nothing to watch, for example, right? I just saw my Game of Thrones and that's, I'm done. So I just want to take it out. But what kind of possibilities I have? So it, it becomes quite tricky in general. And another thing is what we forgot to touch if I would ask a question, what is your biggest cost line in your PNL? You would most probably tell me that this is content, I guess. And when we start to talk about aggregating more and more and more and more, in reality, we're increasing cost extremely. And we are talking about discounts of a bundle of many subscriptions. Unfortunately, as an operator, I'm not getting so many bundle discounts from different content service service providers so for me i'm what i'm doing i'm decreasing my profits because i want to aggregate more i want to give to the client with a better price and buying them separately and we are kind of getting in a very complicated game mm -hmm. which which i think that as operators we are very proud to say that we have a lot of content forgetting to say that we are having a lot of cost and the the most complicated part in this when you see statistics that the biggest part of your clients are not watching so much of the content that you are so proudly presenting to them, and they are not very happy to pay extremely big bills. So I think it's a, top, it's a very, very wide topic, and I'm not sure that we're going to discuss today, but as operators from the business perspective, we, we, aggregation has a dark side, actually. Mm -hmm. So, so that, that that's my take out of the, of the situation. Yeah, it needs to I, I believe that the SQD, sorry, I, I believe that the SQD providers actually came with something that was new in this market. This is a capability to join and leave as as many times as you want, very very quickly, very uh, with a very flexible scheme. And I think that this is something that uh, came to 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 stay. If you want to be in the content market now, you need to think uh, in that way, at, at least for uh, upgrades or downgrades of packages or adding or, or reducing uh, uh, a service like HBO or Netflix to your, to your consumer, to your uh, subscriber, because if not, they will say, okay, with Netflix, I can just leave this month with you. I will need to stay six months. And even if you are offering a discount, this will be uh, against you. So you need also to have a very, very flexible uh, uh, agreement with these uh, uh, content providers because you cannot pay for something that you are not using or your consumers are not using. So um, we, we didn't invent analytics, but now analytics are everywhere. We obviously have them and you need to be able to identify what content you are using or what content you are not using because you know, you don't make the perfect dish, put in as many ingredients as you can. Okay, you need to just choose 
the good ones that I like a spaghetti and my wife will not like a spaghetti. So I need to have something different for if they need to have the flexibility to build their own uh, media con the media aggregation. And you need to be able to offer those elements in a flexible way to build your, their, their, own, their own recipe, if I, if I, if I say so. Yeah, that, that, that's, that's very good uh, theory, I would say, because in reality, uh, for, again, uh, I would be extremely happy to pay only to those content providers whose content is consumed. But unfortunately, uh, if I'm not uh, 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 the biggest uh, operator in the world, that's going to be extremely difficult to achieve, uh, actually not possible even. So I, I think that uh, in general, all the, all the pay TV uh, technologies are evolving extremely quickly, yeah, right? We are having different situation, we, uh, different platforms, different products. Everything is evolving extremely quickly, but contracts and rights with the content providers are so ancient that mm. I cannot even believe. And that's, that's a problem, I guess. And this problem will be bigger and bigger. It would be a it's different so world if there were no business. minimum guarantees, right? <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> but it's, it's going to evolve the whole thing, isn't it? Because now that's the point I tried to make before, that that supermarket itself isn't enough. We need to add more value than that, uh, right? Because just to have different subscriptions available, um, and when it's so easy to jump in and out of subscriptions for the customer, that isn't enough. So you now need to add more value. You need to develop that relationship with the customer, aggregating ease of access, ease of use, uh, recommendations, you need to be really good at things, uh, those things. And I also think you need to develop the bundles. The bundle with broadband, it's, it's, it's strong, right? Because it adds some value on top of the broadband. And that's the direction that we are seeing is very, very powerful. So we're going in that direction and think that that's a viable way of doing it. But at the same time, you also need to develop the relationship with the content providers. That was a question that you had an, earlier, on that, which mm -hmm. I think is good. Because the local content providers, especially not the global big ones, but the local ones, they need distribution power. And we need to develop together with them so we can provide value to the customers, but also provide value, read, uh, read as distribution to the local content providers so that they get better pay up on their content, mm -hmm. making them able to produce more content. And that's sort of the circle of evolution that we're a part of. And then we don't just need to be very, very fast when developing this because things are changing fast. Yeah. Unfortunately, we're running out of time, and that's, um, I really enjoyed this discussion because I think it touched so much aspects of our business. Um, yeah. Um, thank you very much, all of you. Um, I, I really like that, uh, especially the analogy with the supermarket and what kind of role we're playing in the future in, in this business and um, how we manage our inventories and how we adjust the inventories to our um, consumer demand and changing consumer behavior. Um, I think it was also quite um, interesting to hear the different outlooks and different markets. I think that there's a lot of, it gives the audience a different flavors that you really, we, Europe is not homogeneous and never will be. Um, yeah, thank you very much to all of you and um, hope that uh, the audience that listened to us also enjoyed the conversation and discussion. And um, yeah, thank you very much. And I don't know if we will close it, if Priscilla will close the, um, the session now or how that works, but I think we can stay here a little bit online, but um, we'll see how the technical people will probably help us now to close the session. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you guys. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Thank you. The we can start talking about something very interesting and then they will cut us off and, and <laughs> to demand to Thanks give so them back. Yeah, I thought you, you said we should start by 10.30, so I thought it's um, appropriate to not run too much over and uh, I thought somebody from the administration will probably chip in because Priscilla opened the session, so but we'll see. Otherwise.